You're listening to the Liberty Entrepreneurs Podcast, Episode 69, Inside the Mind of a Serial Bitcoin Entrepreneur, with guest Eric Voorhees. Let's go. What's up and welcome back, Liberty Nation. It's your host, Ash. This is the Liberty Entrepreneurs Podcast, and thank you for joining me. Today's interview is with Eric Voorhees of Shapeshift.io, and it's our longest interview ever. It clocks in at around an hour and a half. The conversation was really smooth. I enjoyed it a ton, and I hope that you do too. Before we get into the show, just a quick update. The Liberty Entrepreneurs podcast is in a transition phase and new interviews are still going to be released, but with no definitive schedule. I'm currently trying to figure out the role of this podcast in my growing business, and I hope to launch a cryptocurrency only podcast in the future, as well as start using Facebook Live for Liberty Virtual Assistance. And content creation just takes a lot of time, and I'm trying to put it all together. I don't want to bore some of you who are interested in the interviews with my virtual assistant stuff. So for those on Twitter that give me that feedback, thank you so much. Okay, let's talk about the interview a bit. I've known Eric for about four years now, and we met in Panama City, Panama. And we go into is a fun story on how we met it randomly in this coffee shop with a Bitcoin sticker on his laptop. We go through the early days of Bitcoin and when he was building Satoshi Dice, some old school Bitcoiners will remember Satoshi Dice, as well as BitInstant, and now he's building Shapeshift. We also talk about gold bugs and Peter Schiff and libertarians and the battle of offshore banks versus cryptocurrencies and how the paradigm is changing with respect to holding and protecting and transacting your own money. Stick around to the end because we talk about the Bitcoin scaling debate, why altcoins are important, and why we're missing the point with all this infighting within the Bitcoin community and remembering who the actual opposition is here. Is it really Bitcoin Core and Bitcoin Unlimited? Or is it the monolithic banking industry and the government that gives them their monopoly privileges? All right. Enjoy the show. Please give us your feedback on facebook.com slash Liberty Entrepreneurs. Tweet at us at Liberty E Podcast. And we'll include all of the links in the show notes so that you can go and quickly leave us a review. It means a whole lot. All right. Let's start the show. So, Eric, welcome to Liberty Entrepreneurs. Thank you for having me here, Ash. Eric, let's get started by just a brief bio of who you are and just the things that you're passionate about. Sure. Basically, I've been in the crypto world since 2011 and uh, got into it because I was an advocate of free market money, which pre-Bitcoin meant gold. Gold and silver. But which wasn't used as money anywhere in any retail or transactional capacity. And that always bothered me. I didn't want governments involved in money, but there wasn't really a good alternative to credit cards. And so when I learned about Bitcoin, um, I learned that nobody controls it. I learned that uh, no government in the world can stop it. Uh, I learned that anyone in the world can use it to send value between any two people without permission from anyone else. Uh, I just, I fell in love with it and uh, I've been I've been building projects in Bitcoin ever since. Yeah, so take us back to the earlier days of the Eric Voorhees and your entrepreneurial influences. I know you went to business school. How beneficial was that knowing like what you know now? And just give us an idea of like when your entrepreneurial mindset really started. Business school was not helpful. <laughs> uh, yeah, so I, I went to a, an expensive liberal arts school. It was in an honors business program. They teach you basically how to be like a cog in a large corporate machine. Instead of building your own. Yeah. Mm. Um, I took one class on entrepreneurship, but you can't, you can't really teach it in a classroom. Like you, you learn entrepreneurship by failing a lot over and over and trying things and just kind of getting the feel for it. Um, so yeah, I, I went to school for both business and economics and I learned neither in school, but I feel like I've learned both since. 
Yeah, so talk to me more about that because you're definitely a businessman or entrepreneur and you know a ton about economics, specifically Austrian or as I like to just call it economics because there is no Japanese physics or Mexican physics. You know, there's just physics. So what was it like coming out of school thinking that you had all this information, all this knowledge of business and economics and then you shifted into, let's say, the real world? So I don't think I graduated feeling that I had all this, a bunch, a bunch of knowledge, but I assumed I probably learned a good amount in school. And it wasn't until years later, looking back and realizing that I really didn't know much at all from my formal education. The, the anecdote I like to point out is, so I, I had a, uh, like a double major in economics and I took a class called the history of economic thought. Hmm. And in that class, we learned, um, about all sorts of economists, and economic theories, some of which are still popularly held, some of which are not really in favor anymore. Um, some economists who are well known, some are who are very obscure. And we did all that. Uh, and then a couple years later, after school, I, I learned about Austrian economics and, and Rothbard and Mises and Hayek. And none of those guys were talked about. None of them. None of them. Wow. Not a single, not a single paragraph or chapter wow. in. In a, in a college course on the history of economic thought was given to any of the Austrians. Wow. Uh, and and, and we, were, we were taught some pretty silly economic theories. I'm sure, like Keynes. <laughs> well, Keynes was certainly in there, but even, even theories which the class and the professor knew were silly, but which they wanted to teach because it gives you a diverse set of opinions, right? Or so right. you, so you right. uh, what is not permitted or not allowed in that class is an actual review of free market economics. And why do you think that is? Why is it just a, a straight up no free market economics? I don't know. I mean, I can't imagine that the professor is unaware of Rothbard and Mises and Hayek. I mean, they've certainly become more in favor in the last decade. Well, they have to, right? I mean, because the, the, the prominence of the Austrian school, especially with a, a lot of love from Ron Paul and the Mises Institute, but just the idea that you know, Carl, Carl Menger, who is the father of Austrian economics, a lot of people think it's Ludwig von Mises, but it's actual Carl, Carl Menger. Mm -hmm. I mean, he came up with the praxium that all, like, all value is subjective. And mm -hmm. like, I'm not sure what's much more fundamental than all value is subjective other than maybe all governments print and waste money. Yeah, yeah. It was, uh, it, it really blew me away when I realized that I had not learned anything, uh, even a mention. Yeah. I, I didn't even hear the words the name Austrian economics or any of the names of the economists of that line of thought. And uh, it, it made me fairly disillusioned with, with public education. And, and that may just be totally anecdotal. I mean, maybe other classes around the country do go into that stuff. So I'm just, you know, I had one experience, but it was a, a disappointing one. Yeah, I think our mutual friend, Justin Longo, I can't remember what university he went to now, but they actually taught Austrian economics. And I think it's like one of the few in the country that mm -hmm. do. But yeah, it's definitely not popular. So you learned about the Mises Institute in what year? And then when did you get involved in Ron Paul? Or what was your role in the liberty movement or the mainstream liberty movement? Uh, so after college, I moved to Dubai. And this was in 2008, early, early 2008. And uh, I just, I had started listening to Peter Schiff back then. And so I started hearing some of these terms. And as I'm starting to learn about the Austrian school, and, and I'm starting to really like question why, government is involved in money, what happens? Oh, the global financial crisis happens, right. uh, the fall of 2008. And um, so I got to watch that whole thing right. unfold from, from Dubai, from across the ocean. Mm. And it was a little surreal. It felt different. It didn't feel like it was happening to me in my country. It was like, oh, over there in the U.S. It's happening all this to them. Right. And having that, having that separation, I don't know if it gave me a clearer picture, but it, it was definitely a a phenomenon that I appreciated having gone through and, and seeing all that unfold really solidified my, my skepticism in government managed money. And I, and I came to the, I came to the conclusion that, um, if you actually advocate free markets, which most Americans do to some degree, or at least they think they do, even socialists in the U S even understand though, some yeah. value in some amount of market activity. Right. And you can't have a market a free market without, um, with the money being controlled and centrally planned. By and interest government. rates being set by those yeah. on high. The, yeah. When the, 
when this when the most important price in an economy, which is an interest rate, that that of all the prices of all the goods and services in an economy, the most important one is interest rate, yep. um, and the most important product is money. And when that central central piece of the economy is centrally planned and controlled, you can't claim that you have a market economy. It's a fallacy it's yeah. a sophism yeah it is sophism and i can remember ron paul back in his uh 2008 presidential campaign talking about this and saying a line that i didn't understand back in the day he said you know we shouldn't have government and money because money's too important it's half of every transaction and i'd never thought about that before you know you yeah. you just have money and you give it to somebody and they give you what you're, you want you're bartering of money for a stake right, right? you're you're selling car, your money you're selling your money and buying you're, you're selling your US dollars right. and you're buying a car with it and like that really stuck with me i mean even what 9 10 years later it was like money is half of every transaction and it's way too important for the state mm mm-hmm. mhm so I know that you were living in Dubai, and a shout out to our good buddy Justin Blinko. Uh, wish he was here, but he's got too much work to do. And um, you moved back to the states, and, and where did you move to? And how did the your gold and silver advocacy, or not advocacy necessarily, but just knowledge and appreciation, turn to Bitcoin? What was that like aha moment? Uh, so I moved back in early 2010, uh, back to Denver, and then several months later to New Hampshire to join the Free State Project. And um, I this was pre-Bitcoin, and, and basically a few months after I got to New Hampshire, I learned about Bitcoin and uh, suddenly just realized that, wow, all the things that money should be, there is now a chance to do it. There's a chance to build a new form of free market money that no one can stop. The problem with everything prior was that the only real form of free market money was gold, but you, it's inconvenient to transact. Mm-hmm. So companies that had made like a digital gold, which was convenient to transact, would just get shut down. Right. right. The government would swoop in, shut down their servers, and then boom, poof. Yeah. E-gold was the, the big case study there, right? right? So if you if you make a successful free market gold form of money, if you get big enough, you just get shut down. Right. But Bitcoin, when, it, when, I, when I learned about it, I was like, okay, it'll get, it'll get big because it's just if it's more efficient, it's a more efficient way to move value around. So it'll start to grow. And when it starts to grow, it can't get shut down. So what does that lead you to think? Well, if it's useful, it'll actually keep growing right. unbounded. Right. Uh, thus, I should make that happen and I should get involved and, and it's going to be big. And this was in 2011 when it was very few people had even heard of it. And those who had mostly thought it was a joke. Mm-hmm. Um, a lot of gold bugs were hating on it. I can remember Bitcoin yeah. 2011. The people who should have been natural allies. Who, like Peter Schiff. Peter, Peter Schiff. Schiff should have been natural ally. And I worked for him and built his bank for five years. And he is a gold bug through and through and just does not understand, I think, technology. I, I doubt the guy knows how to turn on a computer. But he just he, either he won't or he can't support bitcoin or cryptocurrencies i I mean he was he was in the business of selling gold right and you know that's great but if it clouds your objectivity if you're anti-bitcoin because you subconsciously perhaps see it as a competitor to your business of selling gold right you're going to have a aversion to it and i think an enlightened person would recognize that aversion and and work to overcome it Right. Be skeptical of your own, like... Of your bias. Of your bias against Bitcoin. Obvious bias there, right? If you're right. selling gold and Bitcoin comes out and you're like, oh, I'm not, I, Bitcoin's stupid. Yeah. Why it has no it? intrinsic value. Yeah. I mean, he, if, if, he, if he is an advocate of free markets, which he, which he claims to be, right. and he's an advocate of free market money and non-governmental money, Bitcoin comes along, he should have been singing its praises. On it. Right? And, Ta- and he can still be skeptical. He can say, look, this is a totally weird thing untested go to zero but damn is this cool right. and we should learn about it that's least. like how stefan molyneux took it like when he learned about it he was like oh wow i need to look at this you know but there mm-hmm. was just so many people in the gold buggy like i used to keep up with king world news and i'm embarrassed to even say that but you know it, it just came out and it was just like typical libertarian hate i feel like it was like just turn yeah. towards it you know it's not us so we're just not going to support it and you know those guys look pretty foolish these days Yeah, I think the differentiator was the people who realized that gold was good money because of its properties Mm. ended up seeing the value of Bitcoin because it shares a lot of those properties. People who um, thought gold was good money because gold is the only form of good money, they 
have this natural aversion to anything else because it's not gold. And we're still seeing that in the crypto space with the Bitcoin maximalists. Yes, the same pattern. The same the thing. Same I'm so glad that I had to live through all that, all the gold stuff whenever Bitcoin came and saw all that ignorance mm -hmm. and hate. Yep. Because I'm seeing it again with guys like Tom Vase, right? Everything except Bitcoin is an absolute scam. Every blockchain, yep. every coin is a complete scam. And it's just that scammy. Saying that stuff, I think, is scammy. Yeah, it's it's really ignorant. Um, it's tribalist. It it's, is tribalist. It's very yeah. collectivist, too. Like, we are the best Bitcoin. Yeah. I love Bitcoin. I mean, I've got my Bitcoin shirt on today, my Bitcoin Pac-Man shirt. Thanks, Davey. But, um, yeah, it, it is a bit tribalist. Eric, I'd like to move along here and talk about some of the businesses that you built. You know, one of the main purposes of this show is to try to help people get into the mindset of an entrepreneur. And you and I both share that mindset. You before I did, even though you're younger than me. And so that's very impressive. And I have a lot of respect for that. Talk to us about, let's start out with maybe BitInstant and Satoshi Dice. Yeah. Uh, so BitInstant was, I would say, the first successful or at least first um, popularly known Bitcoin company. Unless my memory fails me, I think that's a fair statement. I can see the pictures of you, Charlie, and I are up there when Bitcoin is like $4 or something. Yeah. You guys already had a business built around Bitcoin at $4 yeah. Bitcoin. So back in 2011 and early 12, um, Bitcoin didn't really have any professional companies. It was, all, it was like technologists, cryptographers, computer scientists, um, anarchists and libertarians, not really business people. So all the businesses that were starting were started by those other categories starting a business because they wanted to do Bitcoin. Not business guys. Not business guys. Right. And um, so BitInstant was, I think, one of the first successes of the early days. And uh, it was basically a way to move fiat money into an exchange quickly. So back in those days, if you wanted to buy Bitcoin, you had to send a wire transfer, international wire, to Mt. Gox in Japan. And that could take three days or three weeks. Or ever or never. Or never arrive. <laughs> right. Right. So when Bitcoin's rallying and you're like, I want to buy some, and you've made that commitment, if you have to wait a week for the money to arrive and the price just went up 30%, you just lost 30% because yeah. you're waiting. On the old banking system. Right. Which was so ironic. <laughs> yeah, <isn't> um, <laughs> but we realized that uh, you could leave a bunch of fiat at the exchange. And then you could take fiat from a customer at point A and then instantly give them the fiat at point B where it already was located. Right. right. You so guys are basically fronting it for them front, yeah. to wait until their payments right. come. We, right. we would take their fiat uh, that they had. We can wait a week to send that to mm -hmm. the exchange. But as soon as they give that to us, we credit them instantly at the exchange. So it was great very, service. Very simple idea. Uh, great, great service at the time. And, uh, it, it started growing very fast. I, I was the third employee. I was the head of marketing, and it was it was cool. I mean, it was you know during the the early days of Bitcoin. Who were the first two employees? Charlie. So Charlie was the founder, okay. and then he his sort of main engineer. His name was Gareth, hmm. who I've never actually met. He lived in Wales. Okay. Um, he was sort of a recluse, and, but smart programmer guy, and. So he built most of the system. Charlie was the CEO, and then I was head of all the sort of marketing strategy, branding, communication, mm -hmm. and um, it was the three of us. And, and if uh, I recall correctly, you could just like walk into a CVS or 7-Eleven and through some like type of bill pay or something, it looked like you were paying a bill. Uh, how did that work? Yeah, so we just became a vendor or a merchant. You would pay us a bill by going through a CVS. So there's the, all these networks, all these payment networks that people currently use for those who are unbanked, which is a large percent of people that, that exist purely on cash. And so they need, so a person without a bank account needs a way to pay bills, right? So all these services have developed where you can walk into a CVS or 7-Eleven and you pay cash to the teller and then they give they, you know give you a code and you the code gives you credit with a vendor or something. So we plugged into that system and we're able to uh, take payments in cash from people and, and you know, within 30 minutes of someone took, putting their cash at the store, they would have credit at the exchange. In and Japan. start buying Bitcoin at $5 a right. coin. Right. right. Yeah. So, and, and what did it take to like become integrated into that system? I mean, I can't imagine reaching out to CVS and be like, hey, can I be added to your payment system or your bill pay system? Do you recall? Um, I don't recall too much. I mean, Charlie built a lot of those relationships, but those companies want customers. Mm -hmm. So we were essentially just a customer of those companies. And, uh, 
it didn't require any super advanced partnership. It mm. just required signing up with them and receiving payments. And so back then, whenever you would go to conferences, like what types of conferences would you go to? And what was the reception at those conferences? I mean, this is like what, 2012, 2011, 2013? Early 2012. Okay. Um, so yeah, I, I actually went to the first Bitcoin conference in the world, which was in New York City in August of 2011. Mm. That was before I met Charlie. Um, and that was 50 people. So I met, wow. uh, that's where I first met Ira. Trace. Uh, that's, I don't know if I met Trace there. I don't think so. I met Roger there. Okay, cool. I met the BitPay guys yeah. who were just starting BitPay. Yeah. Um, and a few other people who have sort of built a name for themselves in the industry. It was just 50 people. And it was, it was like, wow, there's actually people in real life talking about this. Right. It's not, not just, just us guys online. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so we all thought it was a big thing because 50 people had gathered in New York City for this. Uh, but it was of course so tiny and insignificant back then. Mm -hmm. and, and like, so whenever you go to like non Bitcoin conferences, maybe a money conference or a bank conference or a FinTech conference or something like what, what conferences I were don't. you didn't go to any of those? I mean, pretty much since I learned about Bitcoin, I just have not cared about much else. Mm. So I've never gone to a non Bitcoin. Con well, I went to money 2020 in Vegas in yeah. 2012 and, um, it, I only went because we were there as BitInstant and we were repping Bitcoin. Maybe that's where I saw the pictures. From. Yeah, um, but I've never been to anything that didn't that I wasn't trying to push Bitcoin in some way on. Bitcoin pusher. Yeah. Um, let's talk about Satoshi Dice, Eric. You know, one thing that I'll always remember is that one time Satoshi Dice was fifty percent of all the Bitcoin network. Like, what is that like? Think, seeing how big Bitcoin is now, what is it? Almost a thirty billion dollar market cap now. And to think that half of all the traffic was coming through Satoshi Dice, like just reflect and recollect on me there. Yeah. Uh, Satoshi Dice was this little side project. Um, and it was basically, a, it was a, the first successful Bitcoin casino. Well, that's not true. First well-known successful Bitcoin casino. Um, and basically it was very simple. It had a list of Bitcoin addresses, each with different odds. And you would send Bitcoin to one of those addresses, whichever odds you wanted. And then it would do some very cool cryptographic magic and sort of roll a number. And if you won, you would have a Bitcoin transaction sent back to you that was more. And if you didn't win, you'd have a, a very tiny transaction sent back to you, letting you know that you lost. You, you lost, right. And um, there was just like a certain magic in it. You didn't have to sign up. Right. You didn't have to have an account. You didn't have to wire money through some weird payment processor mm -hmm. to get there four days from now. Or give them any of your information. No information. You just, anybody's approval. It was just a... A, a single web page, you just go there, you see addresses, you send Bitcoin to an address, and your result comes back like Either is, five minutes later. Right. A lot of Bitcoin or a little Bitcoin. And you guys actually posted the algorithm that you used to like so people could see like that it's Yeah, so it was so it was cool because it was it was really easy and right. frictionless. But also uh it was the first popularization of a concept called provably fair. Hmm. And so if anyone's ever been to Vegas, which most people have, and they've played slots, everyone knows that there's a house edge, right? Sure. That's fine. Sure. But everyone also at the back of their mind thinks, uh, what are the odds? Like mm -hmm. They don't publish those generally. Right. And um, if, even if they did publish the odds, are they actually following through with that or are they cheating me? Right. Like, are they, are they taking a bigger edge than they let on? Right. Because there's no way to prove it. There's, there's no, no way, way to, to prove know that, right? as, as the user. No you way put your quarter in a slot machine. It's it could a black be, box. It could be set to never pay out. Right. You wouldn't know. You wouldn't know. Right? Yeah. And yet people gamble billions of dollars a year. Mm. Uh, so Satoshi Dice had this very cool way of um, posting a, a list of secrets, uh, a list of secret hash numbers. And then each day it would reveal the secret that was uh, released for the day before. So um, what that meant, and that, and that hash secret went into the calculation of the role. So basically if, Satoshi Dice um, basically screwed someone and didn't give them the odds or the roles that they were supposed to get, mm -hmm. it would be knowable the next day. Right. So what that meant was that the site couldn't rip people off without being immediately discovered the following day. And ostracized all over the internet. Right. And the, immediately the reputation would be destroyed and it'd be over. So it was a really cool innovation just from a like consumer safety or a gaming responsibility perspective. I would say Satoshi Dice did more to advance the state of consumer protection in gaming 
than every department every of the department government of ever. gambling commissions right. in the world yeah. combined. Completely agree. Right? Like the, yeah, absolutely. Um, it, it was just this beautiful demonstration of the power of Bitcoin and what you could do with, with crypto and, and just a free market where someone can just build something yep. unconstrained by the gatekeepers. Right. Right? Like Satoshi Dice was not uh, vetted or approved by the Nevada Gaming Commission. Right. Um, and it just it, it demonstrated for the first time a fair casino. That, that the free market is actually fair and much right. more fair than when government steps in and try to regulate for the common good or whatever shenanigans they're going to tell us. Right. So for a lot of reasons, it was just a, a cool project and I was, I was really proud to be part of it. Um, and it, it took off. It was, I, I started it when I was still at BitInstant as a side project and it just um, took off. And within a few months, it was, uh, it was half of all coin transactions in the world. Yeah, that's crazy. Yeah. I mean, when was that? Like what, what month do you remember? Probably the entire second half of 2012, it had that title. Wow. Half of all the Bitcoin transactions. I, I can remember using it. I can, and I loved it because unlike Vegas, when you lose, you lose everything. Whenever you lose to Toshida, it's all right, you get some, you get some crumbs back. You, you know? get some crumbs back. Yeah, There's a little bit of like serotonin replenishment. Right. It's like, all right, well, I'm still kind of winning because I'm getting something back. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, it was, it was a, a very cool project and uh, ultimately – because it was gambling and gambling is a gray area in the U S right. because I'm a U S citizen and because I was getting more well-known as an entrepreneur in Bitcoin yep. and Bitcoin itself is controversial. Mm -hmm. Um, and I was a very, a very outspoken proponent of it. I just realized I could either sort of go underground and like run this casino. Yep. Um, or I could be me, Eric Voorhees and be an advocate of Bitcoin. Right. But I, I probably couldn't do both because right. I would just get myself in trouble. Mm -hmm. Yeah, drawing too much attention because not only were you starting to create a name or a brand or just influence, I guess, let's say, you know, entrepreneurs and people that build just naturally and deservedly so have influence on, on society. But you're also working in, a, in Bitcoin, which is competing against the mob's money, right? right. So the, the one thing you don't compete against the mob, it's their money. And it's gambling, which is one area that they really try to only let their friends in. And so you're definitely not one of their friends and you're doubly not one of their friends because you're competing against their, their greenbacks. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, I, it was, it was sad. I mean, it was a great project. I would have loved to keep building it, but I, I was scared and so mm. ended up selling it. All right, Eric, let's come to the present moment a little bit more. Uh, you start a bit instant, did Satoshi dice. I believe that you helped with a company called Coinapult down in Panama for a while. And that's actually where I met you. Let, let's just talk about that story real quick. So you were down in Panama and I, I didn't know you or know of you really, or know that you were living down in Panama, but I was living down in Panama working at your Pacific bank and not that, you know, that's Peter Schiff's bank. So it's, it's interesting that we had that conversation earlier, but I was just down there living and working remotely. Um, and I came to the New York Bagel Cafe one day in El Congrejo by the, the Cabeza de Einstein. And it was, it was like a busy Sunday or something like that, I believe. And all the tables were full. You know, this is like probably the most popular, the busiest cafe in all of Panama City, Panama. And we were scrapping for tables in there. And I was there with my buddy Robinson, who eventually worked for Coin and Pult. But we spotted a table. And all of a sudden I saw someone like snatch it up real quick and I keep my eye on it. And I was like, all right, I'll just have to find another one. And you sat down and opened up your laptop and it had a Bitcoin sticker on the front of it. And I was like, Rob, you are not going to believe this. The guy that stole our table is a Bitcoin supporter. I was like, we've got to go over and introduce ourselves. And we came over and introduced ourselves and it was you, Eric Voorhees. And it, as soon as you said your name, it, uh, it rang a bell in my head because I think not too long before that you were interviewed on the Peter Schiff show. Was that right? Yeah, that's probably around the same time. Yeah, and I can remember you really made some solid arguments. I'll put the link to that interview in the show notes since we're kind of on this Peter Schiff kick right now. But I, I was really impressed. Like that was the first time I'd heard you and I'd heard that interview before I'd run into you at the New York Daily Bagel Cafe. And um, I thought it was just very well argued, very principally argued and very consistently argued. And it, it just didn't really matter. But, you know, if it wasn't for that Bitcoin sticker on the front of your laptop, I'm not sure if uh, 
Yeah. Yeah, it's crazy. It, everything would have unfolded differently. We would have never met probably. Yeah. Um, yeah. We Lives. might. We may have been competing rivals at some point. Yeah, who knows what would happen. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, it, one of the things you learn in life is that like little events sometimes will lead to very interesting paths. Sometimes bad events will lead to actually really good paths. Mm-hmm. And you, you can never know that until it, you can only see it in hindsight, right? You never actually know if something is bad until a year or two or 10 later when you see what happened because of it. Yeah, well, I'm so fortunate because you introduced me to Gabe and Justin and Ira and Cindy and Josh Rossi, you know, just to throw a couple of names out there for our homies. Uh, yeah, it's just a really great story. It's one of my favorite stories to tell somebody because it's not like every day that you're sitting in a foreign country at a random cafe and see somebody with a Bitcoin sticker on the back of their uh, laptop case. But so let's bring it back to the current moment. Uh, you built and worked with Coinaport for a while. And you started to have the idea of shapeshift and started seeing that as a business or as a hobby like Satoshi Dice or just how did you get the idea of shapeshift and ultimately what is it and and how does it benefit people? So the idea for shapeshift came about in February or March of 2014. And basically that back then there were there were a few altcoins. So Bitcoin was like 98% of everything of all of crypto. And there were a few Litecoin, or a few uh, altcoins like Litecoin and Namecoin and a few others. But I started realizing that the technology was going to start branching out into lots of different paths. Uh, and it wasn't just about cryptocurrency. Cryptocurrency was going to be a huge piece of it. But um, other blockchains were going to happen. Other assets would be built on those blockchains. And who knew how many blockchains would exist or how many assets would happen, but it was going to be a a whole constellation of different things. And uh, I realized that to acquire those uh, those assets using a traditional exchange was kind of a pain in the ass, right? You had to make an account, you had to deposit funds, which took an hour or two to confirm, you had to put up bid orders, and most of the world has no idea what a bid order is. You had to wait for that to clear. You had to do a withdrawal, all, all that. And um, and I realized that if you have Bitcoin, you should just be able to snap your fingers and turn it into any other blockchain asset instantly. Mm-hmm. Like there's there should be zero friction. So um, so it came about because I wanted that service for myself. And I was like, well, no one's built this yet. I guess I need to do it. Mm-hmm. And I didn't know if it would be a, a big thing or, or just kind of a side project, but I, I did know that it would be a useful service to at least some group of people. Yeah, because you want to use it. You're I your wanted to use client. it, yeah. So basically, I uh, started building it, and and it was launched in the summer of 2014 just to convert Bitcoin into Litecoin or Litecoin into Bitcoin, just those two directions. Um, And ever since then, it's been growing fast, and we've been adding assets to it. And I don't don't know where I learned or I realized that it wasn't a a hobby side project, but it was actually going to be big. But at this point, it's pretty big. It's huge. um, Yeah, we've been growing probably... Over 50% per month on average for two and a half years mm. per month growth. And that's uh, rare, insane, rare and insane growth. It's yeah. just insane growth. I mean, even, I mean, even in the crypto world where high growth is the norm, right. this has been super, super crazy growth. And, yeah. And what has it been like trying to keep up with your platform and your your uh, your systems and all the, all the things that support your business? Because this is a very technology-heavy business shapeshift is Mm. and because you know everything could be automated i mean everything's hooked up i mean i know that it's still got a ways to be built but what what has it been like trying to keep up with growth like that while also like building the systems to not like go down or break or support that type of growth uh it's been hard and one of the reasons it's been really hard is that um shapeshift uh taking inspiration from satoshi dice does not have any user accounts either And basically, you can go to the website and do a trade with crypto for another crypto without ever signing up for anything. Uh, And it's very simple and streamlined and easy for a user, which is awesome. But to deliver that safe and easy service is actually really complicated. And it requires a whole bunch of different moving pieces on the back, especially when you start getting to a, a large scale. I'll do a little comparison to Google, not because I think we're as cool as Google, but 
just because they have a similar principle, which is that Google is this very simple website, right? It always has been this blank white page with a search bar, and it does one stupid little thing. You, t you type in some text and then hit the search bar. That's search is the internet. That's it. That's right? it. Uh, and yet it's immensely powerful and it became one of the most important companies on earth. And of course, behind that simple web page, that little search bar is an immense amount of pieces and technology and innovation. And so we have a similar phenomenon, which is to deliver a very simple service to a user, which is turn one coin into another coin, it requires this whole suite of changing technologies and, um, you know, running nodes of every single blockchain and keeping those maintained. And at this point, we have we have so many orders with Bitcoin that the Bitcoin client crashes or, or runs out of um, capability every two weeks oh, wow. because we get to like 300,000 addresses in its database. Wow. Uh, and that used to take, we used to have to cycle it like every six months and then every three months and then every two months and then every month. And now we're doing it like every other week. The Bitcoin software was never tested, like the client software was never tested at these scales. And it just, it sucks. Uh, and Bitcoin's not alone in that. I mean, all the different nodes um, have the, their various unique eccentricities and problems. And when you run hundreds of thousands of transactions through them, they, they all sorts of weird shit happens. So, um, yeah, it's it's been it's been really hard, but very rewarding, very interesting. I'm not a programmer, so a lot of this stuff I, I have to just work with very talented people on and, and, and trust them and delegate and they've been great. And the site has grown. I mean, as hard as it's been, we've been able to keep up with the, with the growth. Um, in March, we processed $94 million of orders. Wow. And we're doing at this point about 8,000 customer orders every single day. Wow. I remember in the fall of 2014, when we had a day where we did $3,000 in volume. $3,000. $3,000. Right. And I was like, that's so exciting. $3,000 yes. in right. one day. Like, wow. And now we do $5 million every in a day. day. Wow. And so just the, the perspective is, has been a whirlwind and um, it's, it's still really small compared to, even compared to the crypto exchange industry. Like we have about 1% market share. Of on, all, of all on, the crypto exchanges on, taking on place. Just uh, crypto to crypto exchange. Mm. So not even fiat pairs, but just the trading of Bitcoin to Ethereum or right. Bitcoin to Litecoin. Right. Just that market. We're only about 1% of. And, and would you have been able to create this business if you decided to support fiat money? No, and that's a really good point. One of my lessons at BitInstant was banks suck. Mm -hmm. And like, it's not just a slogan, like banks suck. Yeah, everyone hates banks, right? But no, they actually, they're just horrible. They, they're terrible. They're horrible. They're horrible institutions. Uh, they need to go away. They, they would are. go away in a free market. Yep. And, and to the extent that a free market emerges, banks will, will go away. Not not the service of loans, not the service of holding money or the, the, mm -hmm. the various value adds that some banks value, can do, right. but banks as they exist today and their current model and how they work, that's going away yep. and good riddance. So anyway, uh, banks are horrible to work with. And I, I realized if I wanted to, to build a website that didn't require accounts, we couldn't have fiat. If I wanted to build a service that was useful uh, convenient, easy, that would leave people with a pleasant feeling. I couldn't have fiat involved at all. So I didn't. And, um, that meant in the early days, like we, it was hard to convince investors that we knew what we were doing, oh, that sure. we had a big idea because crypto to crypto was this tiny little, tiny little fraction of what was an already yeah, small Yeah, You had market. like pure coin, name coin and Litecoin, And right. that was like it. And Dogecoin. And Doge, right. And like, so like a quarter of our business is in this token that's like a joke of a mm -hmm. dog face <laughs> you know like yeah how many investors are going to throw money at that <laughs> um so that was a little challenging and uh <laughs> but at this point especially after the rise of ethereum mm -hmm. and people have seen now there are two really <clears throat> dominant very powerful blockchains bitcoin and ethereum yeah and so many interesting tokens happening and uh at this point any investor who sees this space and still dismisses the, the tokenization thesis. You don't want their money. I don't, you know, they're, yeah, you don't want to do business they're, with them. They're going the way of Peter Schiff, right? right like exactly. They, they, they don't exactly. get it. Um, so today it's obvious, but two and a half years ago it was not. Yeah, so I, I want to, I mean, I love Shapeshift. I, I use it all the time. Um, it, awesome support team, first off. 
great intuitive interface on the website is wonderful. Um, I really love how it shows me in the process where I'm at in the exchange. I won't mention any names, but you have a competitor that at times supports coins that you guys don't support. And they just don't, I don't have that same trust in them because it's just like poof magic, I feel like. But well, one, I, one of our principles is that we try to make it, we try to be as transparent as we can. So we publish all the information about the orders on the website. We publish our volume metrics. Um, we show the orders that are happening so you can see like what's being traded. Yep. So we, we just try to have this kind of open, transparent ethos to us. Yep. And, and I really want to talk about wallets, crypto wallets. And I know this isn't directly related to Shapeshift, but back in 2013 and 14 and 15 and 16, it was like, they were getting some wallets made. Entrepreneurs were starting to build different wallets for iOS or Android or, or PC, but nobody could figure out how to profitize wallets. Where was the revenue going to come from? You know, not only did most Bitcoiners require you to be open source before they ever would use your wallet and trust you because there's some closed source wallets that would still just steal your money. Right. But, um, they didn't want ads and since it's Bitcoin, you can't like charge them for anything because it's not like a bank account where you can just like pull money for an account maintenance fee every month. You don't control the private keys and nobody's going to use a wallet that where they don't own their private keys. Shapeshift comes along and kind of changes the game, Eric. Tell us about that. Yeah. Uh, so we have a very simple revenue model, which is that when someone converts one coin into another, they do it at the exchange rate we offer very much like a travel X at the airport where they always have like that billboard of exchange rates. So you come to us and you, you exchange at that rate. We uh, usually can get a better rate than what we offer on the site. Sure. And so the spread between what we can trade at and what we offer to the users is our revenue. So very simple. And so since we have a simple revenue model, when wallets and partners plug into our API and they allow people to convert coins from their services, uh, we can just split that revenue with them. Mm -hmm. And so now there's several really popular wallets and I think their main or only source of revenue is, is the partnership with us. Yeah. And can we say their names? Cause I use both of them and I think they're yeah, both great. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. So the Jack's wallet and I really like the Jack's wallet. You can have it on your PC or, um, in a Chrome extension or maybe a Firefox extension. They have, I think apps for every platform, maybe even Blackberry. I don't wow. know, but. Yeah, Does they yeah. have Blackberry there? I don't know, but there's a Jack's wallet for it. Wow. Well, good for them for supporting ridiculous uh, OSs that some people may still want. <laughs> and the other one, my personal favorite wallet, and I really like this team. I've met them, and they were the only, and maybe the only ever, um, sponsor of Liberty Entrepreneurs Podcast is the Exodus.io wallet. And for now, I believe it's only a desktop wallet. I really hope these guys get a mobile wallet at some point, but they store multiple uh, coins, you know, Ethereum, Dash, Bitcoin, Dogecoin, Litecoin, Augur, uh, Gollum, all sorts of Factum. And yeah, it's just a super clean interface. Anyway, I just want to plug those. Yeah, they're, so we're, we're partners with both of the companies and they, they're making really great stuff. And so um, they get a bunch of revenue each month. Um, we, we sent them quite a significant amount of Bitcoin last few months from the volume they brought us, uh, enough that I, they're probably profitable in those months, just purely from that partnership and that revenue stream. Yeah, and it's, it's streamlined and it's so easy. I mean, look, neither one of these companies or wallets are sponsoring Liberty Entrepreneurs right now. I, I'm literally just saying this because I want to support these guys because I really appreciate the convenience and the wallet that they create. But before this, Eric, was was there a profitable wallet? I mean, I know that like Mycelium was out there, Airbits was out there, uh, Hive or what was it called on iOS? I can't remember the yeah, one. Hive. I mean, Bread Wallet, Blockchain, of course, is the biggest wallet in the world. Yeah. Um, yeah are those guys making money? Blockchain makes revenue. I mean, they, they're huge. Yeah. I don't enormous. think people realize, but blockchain is about half of all the Bitcoin transactions in the world. Wow. Yeah. Blockchain.info wow. or blockchain.com. Um, wow. I didn't know that. Most people don't. Oh, and, and it may not be half right now. Like it may be a little less than that, but um, they are by far the good, biggest Good wallet. job, Nick Carey. Yeah. Um, Never met that guy, by the way. I want to, I want to meet Nick sometime. Yeah. Nick's a great, Nick's a great friend of mine. We went to college together. Um, he went to the same school that didn't teach me business, <laughs> didn't teach him business either, but he's doing a great job. So <laughs> yeah. 
Um, so uh, you know, bl blockchain's really big, and they they have some ads. I don't know that I don't know if they're pro profitable or not, but um, but it's just it's, I, I, I they're think... not trying to be either right now. Hmm. Uh, they raise a lot of VC money, and they're they're just going for market share. Right, and they're doing a good job of it. Yeah, it, it's just like you know, I, I sit here with you, Erica, and I I see you and I as peers. But then I feel like you've revolutionized so much stuff. It's like very impressive. I mean, not only did you revolutionize like just buying Bitcoin quickly with BitInstant, but you also revolutionized um, proof of validity or what did you say about Satoshi Dice? Proof of provable fairness. Provable fairness. I mean, that in and of itself, it might have well, been. So I, I have to give credit where credit's due. Okay. I mean, in, in BitInstant, it wasn't. It wasn't my idea. I didn't start it. Um, the credit for that concept and getting that off the ground goes squarely to Charlie yeah, and, and Gareth for programming it. And if you want to and hear Roger Veer for investing in it, love Roger Veer. Um, if you got Roger Veer gets a lot of unnecessary hate to these days. I really appreciate him trying to make Bitcoin usable for like small transactions stuff like that. Won't get into that too much right now. But if you want to, if any of my audience wants to hear my interview with Charlie Shrim. I think it was like uh, number sixty-seven or so. I'll make a link in in the show notes. But yeah. So, um, and then provable fairness. I mean, I wish I was smart enough to have thought of how that works, but mm -hmm. I'm not a, a computer scientist or an engineer. Um, but I helped make it popular. I helped bring it into a service that people like to use. And the, the the cool thing about Bitcoin is like all these different talents from people get to be combined easily like, mm -hmm. like any two people in the world can work together and make something great they don't need permission from anyone uh, and this is why bitcoin's growing so quickly this is why there's so many different tokens and so much experimentation going on this is why the internet took off right when everyone right. was using aol which was a much more curated and professional better content early on yep and it lost and it lost big because anyone in the world could connect to the the web and contribute to it yeah. and um that that overwhelmed anything like AOL. Yeah, I can remember when I thought AOL was the entire internet. Yeah, it used like to back be. in the nineties. I mean, yeah, I every, mean, it was. It was most of it. I it didn't was, know I could open up Internet Explorer, Netscape Navigator, and go outside of AOL. I was like, whoa, what is and this? And if you did, it was ugly. Oh, it was it scary. It scared you back into AOL. You had to AOL. type in an IP address, go to a website, and you're like, I'm I'm back in yeah, this like, AOL chat room on like cars. <laughs> yeah, yeah, uh, and and the same same phenomenon is happening in in Bitcoin with this with these blockchain projects, right? So you have Bitcoin and Ethereum and the others that are open public blockchains that anyone can access. And then you have these big institutions making private blockchains. Mm, like Ripple. Uh, Rip, no, that's not quite fair. Ripple is kind of open, but kind of not. They're right. sort of straddling the two. But uh, That's another conversation, but I, I, I really like Ripple, actually. Coming from the banking world, I, I think that there's a, a definite use case for Ripple. Uh, talk about another crypto token that got a lot of hate from Bitcoiners back in the day was Ripple. Yeah. Um, I mean, unfortunately, the Bitcoiners, the, the maximalists, they, they hate anything that's not Bitcoin. And a lot of the stuff they hate is hateable. Like it's stupid. A lot of it is stupid. But when you're so full of hate that you just hate everything wholesale, you miss the gems. Ethereum was one of the gems. Ethereum and, was a gem. Um, yeah. So it's that's a shame. But yeah. So, so let's let's come back to Shapeshift and about something you did revolutionize, which is the eliminating the need for accounts. And how that protected the client, because I believe you guys were hacked about six months or a year ago, weren't yeah, you? Yeah. yeah. Talk us, talk, talk me through that. Like what, what happened, and how much customer funds were actually compromised? Well, thank you for setting it up that way. <laughs> um, so, in the history of Bitcoin, you've had a lot of hacks, right? It's like been the epidemic of the industry. Um, lots of small ones, lots of big ones, and the ultimate Mt. Gox, right, yep. which $400 million is Ooh. lost, and, and it sets Bitcoin back by two years. And um, right. it's just, it's been horrible. And it's because while Bitcoin is decentralized, every exchange that's connecting to fiat has to have user accounts and has to hold money, has to hold fiat on one side and crypto on the other and, and match people that are trading one for the other. Um. And so with Shapeshift, one of the, so first I didn't want to handle fiat, and second I didn't want to hold customer funds, right? Uh, because I had seen all these hacks happen, and no matter how good you are at security, you can't be perfect. And there's when there's digital gold sitting in your digital vault, every hacker in the world, <clears throat> and there's some really good talented people out there, uh, are going to target you. 
So you almost have to assume you will be hacked. Mm -hmm. um, even, you know, no one, no one can resist hacks. The biggest companies in the world get hacked. The, gov the U.S. government gets hacked all the time. Um, the Chinese government gets hacked all the time. The Chinese and U.S. governments hack each other. Like, hacking is the norm. Right. It's the new war. Yeah. It's, and it is how it is. It's just the norm that people should expect. So uh, if you're holding customer money, you're going to lose it. Mm -hmm. Or you, you, there's a big risk that you'll lose it. And so... Uh, I didn't want to deal with that. So we set up Shapeshift such that uh, when someone sends in a certain coin, we send them the other coin right away within seconds or a few minutes. So at any given time, we never have any significant amount of customer funds on deposit. And uh, about a year ago, we had a well-publicized hack um, in which a internal employee who ironically we had hired to do our DevOps and our IT security Got to watch out for those IT guys. <laughs> they well, know too much. Not to generalize, this specific individual was just a horrible person, <laughs> right. and he he deserves all the blame. Uh, he he basically stole he 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 had access to all our hot wallets, right? And he stole all the Bitcoin that we had available. Mm. Um, and yet, even though we were hacked by an internal person, not a single customer lost a single dollar, nor could they have because we didn't hold any customer money. So it was the first exchange hack in which no customer funds were at risk. And this, of course, this is only because the government came in and inspected you, audited you, and exactly. gave you a regulation. Yes. yes. So when I started Shapeshift, I went to the U.S. federal government, and I, I got down on my knees, and I, yep. I said, you know, please help me make this safe for people. Yep. Uh, I really want your permission and your blessing. And they, they designed everything to be secure. And built everything for you. Built everything. For, yep. They, they used all the all the you know, crazy amounts of tax money I've paid them. And yeah. they, they really helped me out to they build a great systems, service for customers. Hired your staff. Yeah. No, none of that happened. Nothing. No. No, no. Uh, we built a secure system because we are capitalists and we want to attract business. Exactly. Uh, and, and we did. We built the most secure crypto exchange in existence. Ever. Yeah. Ever. In existence. Not because the regulation told us to. That's right. And while I think we're good people, it isn't necessarily because we're good people that we built it, but we built it that way because innovation leads to good, uh, leads to good product development. Mm -hmm. So it was the first Bitcoin hack in which no, no customer funds were at risk. And I think that was a, a really awesome milestone. And as we lost several hundred thousand dollars, it was our own money. Yeah. Our, our inventory of the coins that we sell to people. Right. So it really hurt. I mean, it was, um, it was a, a hellish month, uh, trying to put things back together and dealing with that financial loss and all the all the problems that like come from feeling like something something intimate is no longer secure and there's mm. just like a very deep uh, discomfort that you get from that when mm -hmm. something that you feel is safe no longer is right so there's a lot of like psychological just like intensity to it uh, but we got through it and it was a great milestone for the industry and I think we we turned it into a great PR story. We we told everyone what happened, and you were so upfront and so transparent about whatever happened, and you, know, you were blogging about it and telling people about it. It really changed the game. I mean, if J.P. Morgan got hacked and customer money would obviously be stolen, they they're not going to come out and be honest and transparent about what happened. Yeah, you mean they're, when, they're gonna, they've, when they've been hacked, right? You when, don't know about it, right? Because they right. didn't tell anyone. Exactly. They're going to go plead to the government to print more taxpayer money up and right. get bailed or, out. Or it's not necessarily money that's stolen, but information, right? Which, that's true. which is money in right. some senses. Uh, and so, not only are you not keeping the the client's money for but a couple seconds, mm -hmm. you require another information. Yes. So, is, so that's like doubly secure. This is important. Like if you, if you care about consumer protection, you can't endanger them by taking all their personal private information and storing it on your server. Like yeah. what's your obvious. mother's maiden name? I mean, come on, how secure is that these days? <laughs> right. Like most, most websites with accounts, especially if they're financial in nature, have become warehouses of valuable private information and they get hacked all the time. When target got hacked, they didn't lose money, but they right. lost millions and millions of customer information. Right. And that stuff turns into identity theft, which yeah. actually causes financial losses to people. Way more. Yeah. And this, this statistic blew me away. So like when I was learning a lot about, uh, about data privacy, I came across this statistic uh, that in the U.S. alone, identity theft is responsible for about 40 or $50 billion of losses a year. Whoa. That amount is greater than the sum of car theft, 
property theft, all basic uh, crime, all basic property like petty crimes. crime and everything. Right. Wow. Every, all thefts combined of, of money and property are less than the loss suffered every year by identity theft. Wow. Wow. And like, that's pretty profound. Really let that sink in yeah. for a second. That's insane. So in other words, all the, um, all the law enforcement that the U.S. government does to protect uh, against property theft, which is sort of what people think of when they think of a cop, like the cops are there to make sure the bad guys don't steal stuff from your house, right? <laughs> so, yeah, that's exactly why the cops are there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, so basically the government could do a better job of protecting the actual financial of reducing financial losses from theft by allowing companies to not warehouse private information. Right. Like you can't get private information by hacking shapeshift Mm. and banks, uh, they they can't even, they can't even do that because the laws require them to endanger people by taking their private information. Let me just jump in here. It's, it's complete and utter madness. As many of you know, and, and I haven't spoken much about my experience with Euro Pacific Bank, Peter Schiff's Caribbean Bank, up until this point, because I was the head of business development for them for a very long time, and I just resigned last month. Now I have no affiliation with them and feel that I can finally speak freely about Euro Pacific Bank. And this has nothing to do with Euro Pacific Bank specifically, but just the banking industry, specifically the offshore banking industry in general. Let me just walk you through a scenario. And this isn't a hypothetical scenario. This is a scenario every single day. You apply for a bank account. We call you and interrogate you, straight up interrogate you. Who are you? What do you do? How long have you done it? Where did you go to school? Why do you think that you have the experience to run this business that you're telling us that you're running? Who are your clients? What what purpose does your product have? How much money is each client going to be sending you every month? What is your total turnover every month? What currencies do you need? And then you have to give us a form for every single one of your clients that sends you over just a couple thousand dollars in, in, in business every month. You have to fill out a new partner's form and send it to us. So not only do we have your passport, notarized passport, notarized utility bill, bank statements or a bank reference, countless other anti-money laundering documents receipts or invoices or contracts or everything that you can imagine. I've, I've literally been forced to ask for everything that you can imagine. But then when you finally get your money, like when you finally get your account open, you have to get our blessing to get it deposited, right? You send money into your account. We're the great buffer. We're the great monetary firewall between you, your mo- you and your money. And if you don't satisfy me or my compliance department, Guess what? Your money gets sent back. We, of course, we charge you a wire fee and a return wire fee, and then it goes back to your client. And, and, and think about how that makes you, the business person, the entrepreneur, look whenever your bank doesn't think that you've sent them enough documentation to prove that you're not a criminal or a terrorist. They send the money back to your client. Now, do you think they're going to do business with you? Do you think that's good or bad for your business? With cryptocurrencies, it's turning all that on its head, isn't it, Eric? Yeah, I, I mean, you said that great. Very few people understand the rotten core of banking. And it's because most people in the U.S. don't really deal with any international business, right? They have their bank account. They receive their W-2 payment from their employer. They use their credit card. They never actually um, utilize any sort of uh, money transfer uh, across, international. Um, across international lines. Right. And part of that is because they have this privileged position of being an American and they, they live in this little like happy bubble. In most of the world, dealing with international finance and money transfers is a nightmare. And um, especially if you're trying to run a business, right? Business is hard enough. Just the business side. If you have to, when you have to deal with all this crap with the money, um, it just, it, it sinks all sorts of businesses. It slows down businesses. And, and even when it doesn't kill firms, just the fact that it retards their growth actually means that the entire global economy is slower. So it's like and molasses. Smaller, yeah. slower and smaller than it otherwise would be. Right. Yeah. So the world is poorer because all this transaction gets slowed down like molasses. Yeah, it takes so much time just to send or receive a wire. Think about this. 
One of the main ways to send money throughout the world is the SWIFT network. All right, SWIFT, S-W-I-F-T. It's only SWIFT in name, I can, I can assure you, because it was built for fax machines back in the day, right? If you look at a SWIFT message, it's just a bunch of text on like 25 lines, right? It was built literally for a fax machine, for somebody like, pick it up. Oh, okay, yeah, I'll, I'll take this fax and execute that on our banking software here and credit Bob Smith with his money. You know, and that's even assuming that you're going to credit Bob Smith with his money. It's, it's taking, you know, there's no way that a wire is going to take less than three days. And there's no way that a wire is going to, that you're going to get your money sent to you in less than about five days after it takes the SWIFT system, the slow system, three days to process it, five days to process it. But then another two or three or five days to convince the bank that it's your money and you're not a terrorist. Uh, so good. Imagine it how, how much faster and more, more wealthy the world would be if we had a cryptocurrency-based financial system. Right, where you remove friction from half of every transaction, which is the movement of money. Like, the, the entire world accelerates. And this is not just, this doesn't just mean that everyone makes more money and so we're all a little richer and we can all have, like, nicer cars. This means that, like, every charity that you care about receives a little bit less or a lot less money because the world economy is slowed down. It means that every important project that humans are doing is a little slowed down or a lot slowed down because the flow of money moves more more slowly. Um, th people don't realize this because they don't know what to compare it to. Because but, there hasn't really been much. Right, right. But those of us who've gotten into Bitcoin and see how money should work, which is right. here's an address, click send, now it's over there. Boom. Right? Like an email. It's exactly. just data. It's just data. Uh, one of the anecdotes I like to say to people, it's not really an anecdote, but an example. If you're trying to send... $10,000 to your friend in Japan. It is easier to take $10,000 in cash, duct tape it to an anvil, <laughs> and mail the fucking anvil yeah. to Japan. Right. It's literally faster. That is faster. And maybe cheaper. Maybe. Uh, uh, maybe, maybe not. Maybe not, maybe not cheaper. It's faster, and it will probably it has less likelihood of being stopped. Mm. Right? Like... Mm -hmm. <laughs> If your if your transfer gets blocked, that takes you know that might take forever. And if your transfer gets blocked by your bank and they start getting curious about your obvious criminal tendencies, your account may just be shut down. Right. It could just straight up be shut down. I mean, and the bank know, has zero incentive to help you out with that um, because interest rates are so low they don't need the customer money and, anyways. And, but that's a whole other. And because they have, and the banks aren't the aren't really the villains. The banks are are villains. Because they are so close to government that the, the corruption right. and the inefficiencies of government just seeps into every aspect. That's of why banking. I had to get out of the banking industry. Yeah. It's just so closely tied. Yeah. Ba banks are not uh, inevitably horrible. They're horrible because of how close the tentacles of government have wrapped around them. Yeah. Um, just like healthcare and education. Yeah, exactly. Like the education that I didn't get that I paid a lot of money for. Me and you both. Yeah. Um, it's, uh, it's a bummer. So let's let's transition to another exchange that got hacked recently or semi recently, Bitfinex. It, this may be the largest exchange in the world. Uh, I'm not sure. If it's not, it's one of the largest. And it was at the time. Right. They got hacked yeah. for almost a hundred million dollars worth. I think of, it was about eighty five million dollars. Mm. Uh, and this was last summer. Yeah. Like July or August. Yeah, I, I was, you know, I, I unfortunately was was one of the people that got hacked and lost Bitcoin over there. And um, unlike Shapeshift, they do have client information and they do control the client's crypto uh, private keys. And so client funds were lost. Uh, but they did something really interesting, Eric, with the Bitfinex token. And you wrote very beautifully about that when it happened. Just take us back through that Bitfinex hack what Bitfinex did with their token and what the outcome was. Yeah, um, this this will have to go down in like MBA textbooks about the new future of finance and like what blockchains and tokens are able to do. What Bitfinex did was they, they lost something like $85 million, um, which was something like 60% of customer deposits, Oof. something like that. I don't know the exact amount. Insane number. So basically, if you had $1,000 on deposit, suddenly um, 600 of it was gone. Mm. Uh, and traditionally, in any traditional business, that would have meant immediate bankruptcy. Bankruptcy, yeah. Um, 
all done. And it, you probably wouldn't get your 40 percent back for, for years, if ever, and, and half that would be taken by lawyer fees and bankruptcy court, which is exactly what's happening with uh, Mount, Mount Gox, Gox right, right like, now. Uh, yeah. I lost money in Mount Gox, still haven't seen a dime of it, even yeah. though it's been in the courts for years. Um, so Bitfinex did something very, very creative and um, revolutionary. Revolutionary, yeah. yeah. They, they deserve an immense amount of praise for it. Absolutely. And they got a lot of hate. They got a lot of initially, yeah, cynicism and skepticism for this plan. But that's not uncommon for Bitcoiners or libertarians, yeah, right? They, but they've they've demonstrated that it was the right idea. But so basically, what they did was, if you had a thousand dollars before the hack, and now you had four hundred dollars, six hundred had been stolen. They gave you six hundred dollars or six hundred tokens, right? Basically, that they made out of thin air called Bitfinex tokens. So now you had four hundred dollars and six hundred Bitfinex tokens. Um, and you say, okay, well, that's stupid. What the hell is the point of a Bitfinex token? Then they allowed trading on their exchange for, they made a, a pair for Bitfinex tokens to dollars and Bitfinex tokens to Bitcoin. So if you had 600 um, Bitfinex tokens, you could now trade them for dollars or Bitcoin. And, and one thing, and they said that they hope to pay one dollar for every one Bitfinex tokens. That that was like right. that, so the, that was where the idea of the value the token, came from. The token was a contractual obligation of Bitfinex to pay you one dollar if they could in the future for that token. So so eventually you get all your money back, right? Right. It was an IOU saying if somehow Bitfinex ever can do it, they will pay you a dollar for each token. Yeah. Um so that meant that the the tokens had potential value, not not current value, but potential value. And so people start trading these. So what's the value of a one dollar token that may be paid back one dollar? Right. Who maybe, knows? Maybe, yeah. Maybe I'll pay fifteen cents for it. Right. The only way to figure out is with a market. Exactly. Right? Some some people don't trust Bitfinex at all. Right. So they'll sell at a penny because they'd rather have a penny than a make believe dollar. Some people are like Bitfinex is awesome. They're the biggest exchange in the world. They're a profitable business. This they're, they're coming get through back. this. Yeah. I will pay ninety cents because I'll get a dollar from it. Right. And everything in between. Yep. So you have this uh, this incredible spontaneous market occur, and at first the price of these tokens is very volatile. It it falls down. I think it fell down to fifteen cents, the mm -hmm. very lowest, for for a dollar token, and rose back up to eighty cents and fluctuated all over the place. Um, and and what it did was it allowed Bitfinex to keep operating, so they were not forced into bankruptcy court, and um, they did a lot of work in convincing people that they were safe, they re-secured their systems and they they pulled themselves up after the hack and they they kept trading, you know, their normal fiat and, and bitcoin pairs and they started earning some money. Um, and each few weeks, each month, they paid like 1% or 2% back. Them. Yeah, they, they redeemed them, yeah, they redeemed redeeming. the redeemed the tokens back. Which gave more confidence in the token so the token price rose. Right, right. Yeah. So, so they, they kept operating, they made profit, and they were buying the tokens back at par value of a dollar. Um, and as that happened, people got more and more confident, and the, the coins rose in value. Um, they also gave people an option, which was to convert those tokens into equity. Mm -hmm. So if you had um, 600 which again, tokens, genius. yeah, um, instead of getting a potential dollar, you could convert it into some shares in the company. Yep. So some people wouldn't be interested in that. Others would be like, yeah, this is a great discount on the valuation of Bitfinex. I will absolutely convert this debt into um, equity in the company. So a lot of people did that, and that redeemed a certain portion of those tokens. Um, people that needed cash immediately would sell would sell at the discount and get, get cash. So instead of losing 60%, maybe they lost 30%. Right, because very quickly it went to 50 cents on the yeah, dollar. Like yeah, yeah. Pretty quickly. And so all of a sudden you only lost half of what you thought right. you lost. Right, so they lost $80, $80 million or whatever in the hack. And because of the magic of markets and tokens and sure. risk trade-off and just exchange between consenting adults, they actually cut the losses in half, like in, in a couple of weeks. It's amazing. They just created their own token. And this has never been done before. Yeah, you know? Never. It, it, it's not like you could just go out and create your own money. I mean, look at what happened to eGold. You create your money, the government mob comes in and they, they, you know, they end you, right? They shut down your business. They steal all your money and all your technology and they throw you in jail. Yeah. And, and I was worried actually that that would happen with Bitfinex. Mm. I was worried that um, I liked their plan. I thought it was really cool. But I was worried that some government regulator 
in all their wisdom, was going to come in and shut them down and force them into bankruptcy. Right. Which would be the, and I was someone who lost money in Bitfinex. I was a victim of the hack. Yep. And um, I, I was like, God, this is just going to be the greatest irony if the government comes in, forces them into bankruptcy, and I, I lose everything because of the stupid government looking out for me. Yeah. <laughs> Fortunately, that didn't happen. That's largely Amazingly because, so, because they're in Hong Kong, Because right? they're not a U.S. company. I don't hesitate for a second to say if they were a U.S. company, they would have been shut down immediately Absolutely. and everyone would have been screwed. Yep. They had the foresight to not base their company in the USSA. And um, it hasn't even been a year since the hack, and they have paid back all the coins. They 100%. Redeemed them all. Or, or yep. uh, actually, they either redeemed them into equity or they paid them back at par. And right. basically, they've gotten rid of all the debt. Amazing. Uh, it's, 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 it's literally amazing. Yeah. It just shows you, like, from your hack, from not having customer funds, to the Bitfinex hack that did have customer funds. But since they, didn't ha since they weren't regulated to death like all the banks are, they actually had the ability to have that entrepreneurial creativity right. to continue to solve the pains and problems of their clients. Right. A bank could never do that. Never. Never. Ever. It couldn't even come up at a boardroom for discussion. No, it, it just it would no be way. illegal. Yeah, absolutely, it would be illegal. Actually, yeah. it, they it, would be barred by the bylaws of the banking regulations of you know 1907. Yeah, yeah, fuck that. Yeah, it, it's it's insane. I, I you know, I I really appreciate the creativity, and, and even I, the first day or two that I heard about this, as a skeptic, I was like, oh, this is just some token they're creating, but. I made sure that I, since I had a loss, uh, a decent loss, I was like, I'm going to read about this. And the more I read about it, the more I like started to really appreciate it. And now you're right. I hope that unlike your economics degree in classes where they didn't teach anything about real economics, I hope that in business and finance classes, they actually do include this at some point in the future. I'm sure they won't because Not universities are way too socialist to talk about the free market's ability yeah. to solve people's problems. A business but, protecting its own users is like unthinkable. Right. Because it doesn't happen, right? Because everyone's just greedy and out to screw everyone. Yeah. Catalyst just wants to screw us all up. Yeah. Um, let's talk just very briefly about this whole block size thing, Eric. I, I interviewed you and Roger Veer about a year ago, I believe. Um, on this and it hasn't moved that much recently i was trying to send one of my virtual assistants a tip of five dollars you know i thought he did a really great job on a video and i wanted to just give him five bucks in bitcoin and the wallet i was using with a normal transaction fee was going to charge me over three dollars for that transaction fee now i don't blame the wallet at all because they're just trying to help me get my transaction confirmed but it's regulated me from sending a $5 tip in Bitcoin these days when sending $5 used to cost me, I mean, nothing. You could opt for no, penny, yeah. no fee at all or maybe a penny and it, it would get confirmed. And now to send $5 is $3. Where do you see this going, Eric? And, and what do you think about the Bitcoin transaction fees being so large that the vision, the initial vision that we all had for Bitcoin where it could help the unbanked and the poor in third world countries or something, that really no longer seems to be possible. Yeah, it is the it is the biggest challenge that Bitcoin faces, and by extension, that the whole crypto industry faces is Bitcoin's block size issue. Um, Bitcoin has a number of valuable attributes, and one of those is the um, how inexpensive it is to move money anywhere in the world. And when I got involved, that really meant pretty damn inexpensive, mm -hmm. like a penny or two pennies or less than a penny to move any amount of money anywhere in the world. It was amazing. And a lot of the early evangelism that we would do to get people to listen to why Bitcoin was worth spending their time on was that, hey, isn't it cool to be able to move any amount of value in the world instantly? For free. For free. Right. Or nearly free. Yeah. And that's very compelling. Absolutely. Like anyone who's Anyone who's tried to send $100 and paid a $30 wire fee can get that right away, mm -hmm. right? Any, any person who sends money back to their family in Mexico and they, they save up for two weeks to get $200 and then 50 of it is taken by MoneyGram, right. they get that. Absolutely. Um, and so Bitcoin has been good for this whole suite of use cases. And as the congestion has gotten bad because the block size limit is this artificial restraint, 
um, the fees to get into a into a, the next block have risen, and it, it means now that a typical transaction fee is fifty cents to five dollars, mm -hmm. uh, and, and depending on some complexities, it can actually be a lot more than that. Um, that prices out a lot of use cases. Yeah, it price it, it makes it means Bitcoin is not economically useful for a for a suite of things that it used to be useful for. A large suite of things like. A lot of everyday purchases. Yeah. Even going out to eat. Yeah. Say you spend fifty bucks out to eat, then you have to spend five dollars for a transaction fee. Yeah, I used to. I you know, my friends and I would always pay each other for for beers with Bitcoin, right? Someone would buy the tab, and then other people would send Bitcoin. It was great. It worked awesome. Yeah. Um, that's kind of silly now. Because you're like you're paying two tab. beers. Yeah. Yeah. If you buy a beer or two, the fee, you know. Just use Venmo or PayPal, and how much does that suck to use sucks to, so to go back to PayPal? Right, because Bitcoin is too expensive. That, yeah, like that's not it hurts. That's not okay. No, it's not. Um, and so the the question is like, how bad of a problem is it? Because at the same time that that's a problem, Bitcoin is stronger than ever. Right, it is more valuable, more valuable than ever. per coin. Right, it has the h higher number of transactions than ever before. It is more well known. It is more respected i would say today than ever before mm -hmm. it's gaining prestige and reputation and used by more and more people the, it's it is it is growing and it is doing well but creeping up behind it is that a lot of use cases are starting to be priced out and so people can disagree about how important that is like is that a huge problem is this a sky is falling thing and bitcoin better better fix this in the next six months or else it's gonna go the way of myspace or friendster mm -hmm. or is it like not really a big deal and people, we shouldn't distract ourselves with that little problem. You don't. You, Bitcoin shouldn't be used for buying a beer at the bar. It's much more important for other things. Mm -hmm. There is truth in both those positions. Mm -hmm. uh, and part of the problem with this block size debate is that both sides refuse to acknowledge the truth in the other side's points. Right. And this is tragic because it these is. people are all. They should be all on the same team, right? Yeah. Like they're all. They're all fighting to build cryptocurrency as and it an just it just reminds me of libertarian infighting again i mean i know i keep going back to this but it's like why is it so difficult to see like okay the bitcoin maximalists for lack of a better term and i hate using labels but they want bitcoin to be this large secure proof of work blockchain that is the safest to send very large amounts of money i, I get it you know if i want to send ten thousand dollars the only blockchain i would use would be bitcoin Right, because Why? I, because I, I'm okay with spending five dollars to send that. Mm -hmm. Right, because it's such a small fraction of what I get. I mean, from what I'm sending, and I get to use the biggest, strongest blockchain available. So five dollars for me to to very securely and confidently send ten thousand dollars, not a big deal. It's cheaper than a wire. It's faster than a wire, and I'm not going to be required to do all the AML KYC of a bank. I'm, mm -hmm. I'm okay with that. But I, I find a lot of the time that the Bitcoin maximalists aren't able to see the what are we going to call these other people? Bitcoin, small Bitcoin transaction people, Roger Veer. I, I don't know. I don't, I don't know. But they want Bitcoin to be able to, to scale to the point that it can be used for everyday type of purchases. And there's a lot of demand in everyday type of purchases. And the, the truth of the thing is that it's, it's turned into this stupid false dichotomy or this, this binary where some people think it's a settlement layer and it's only for big things right some people think no it should be for coffee and micropayments and mm -hmm. and, and but neither side is wrong or, or right it, it is a situation in which the more expensive the fees are the less it is used for certain things it's a gradient so how how far down that gradient should bitcoin be right. to to maintain its its edge and its adoption curve if you price out too many use cases, Bitcoin will fail. Yep. Like that's a fact. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that means $5 fees are too much or $5,000 fees are too much. But at some point along that curve, Bitcoin fails because the fees are too high. Um, it just, it, it loses to someone more efficient, even if it's just a Bitcoin clone that has a two megabyte block instead of a one megabyte block. Yeah, I mean, we see Dash at 100 US a coin right now and, and there's no surprise there. Well, to some of us, there's no surprise there <laughs> because, you know, it's trying to cater to those smaller instant type right. of transactions that Bitcoin just cannot service anymore. Right. Bitcoin has a, a suite of utility to it. And if you start cutting off some of that utility, maybe that's okay. But if you cut off too much of that utility, it fails. 
And yeah. no person, no matter how good of an engineer you are, how good of an economist you are, how prescient you are, how long you've been in Bitcoin, um, nobody knows where along that curve Bitcoin should be. Um, and for that reason, the, the sides should acknowledge their own inability to know the future, their own inability to know exactly what Bitcoin should be. And they should try to work together and they should realize that all the sides have pretty good points. Yeah. And, and they all want to see Bitcoin succeed. That's the right. thing. Like we're all on the same team. We want to see Bitcoin succeed. Some people want to see Bitcoin succeed differently than other people. But at the very end of the day, we all want to see Bitcoin succeed. So I just hope all this infighting stops. Like I'm actually a little bit surprised by the recent rally in Bitcoin because of all of this uncertainty and bickering still in the community. But at the end of the day, the Bitcoin technology is just so revolutionary and world changing that I'm not too surprised of it. Yeah, I don't think the bickering will stop. I think the, the argument got, everyone lost the argument. Um, everyone lost. Nobody convinced the other side that they were right. And now the bickering continues in perpetuity. The only thing that'll settle it now is either a, a collapse, like a failure of Bitcoin and, and an overshadowing by an arrival, or um, Bitcoin will keep its current model and succeed, and that, that will ultimately win the day, mm -hmm. or some kind of hard fork will happen, right? and that will settle the issue. That'll be a violent way to settle it, but that would settle the issue. It'd be really horrible in the short term. The price would fall by 50 or 80 percent and then there's two bitcoin and there's bitcoin. two bitcoin and that would be a big mess but that, that would get resolved yep. and a year later bitcoin would be stronger just than like it is today. right right so in other words the debate is not going to be settled by people talking anymore which is really tragic mm -hmm. the debate will be settled by the realities of market competition and uh and we'll see what happens you know as as a bitcoiner um i'm sad to to see that uh, as someone who has embraced the entire cryptocurrency industry and is in this for free market money, wherever it comes from, right. um, I don't worry as much as I would if I was just a Bitcoin maximalist. Although I guess the Bitcoin maximalists don't worry because they assume Bitcoin is the only value in the world. Were you a Bitcoin maximalist at one I was, time? Yeah. yeah, very much so. I, I was absolutely one of the people that said altcoins are totally stupid. Um, they're just a distraction at best. They are outright dangerous at worst they take away from from bitcoin it was a really myopic and ignorant view and uh i i've relented that view mm -hmm. and it, it came from realizing that um a lot of these different coins were, were actually innovating in different ways and that could be useful to bitcoin and that bitcoin could learn from them um, or it would challenge bitcoin to become better or if they took over and bitcoin failed that's fine the, the right the point of, of Bitcoin in the world is not that Bitcoin succeeds. The point of Bitcoin in the world is that the world has free market money. And, and that cryptography money, like cryptographic money, is now available. Right. Is, yeah. is to give... Because that genie's not going back in the bottle. Right. The, the point is that people now have a way to opt out of the global fiat financial system. Thankfully. It's not that the orange B logo carries the day. Right. And the maximalists have unfortunately, um, start, un, unknowingly, I think really fallen in line with the latter they're kind of the peter schiff of the crypto space they are yeah and I, and I you know i support bitcoin more than anyone i you know most of my wealth is in bitcoin i i still advocate it to everyone it is it is one of the world's greatest inventions and i still think it will carry the day if only one cryptocurrency does but i don't think it's invincible and i don't think that other coins don't uh provide value. And I also don't think all these different assets compete with each other or that it's a fixed pie. I think right. they all help each other. I like think, Factum doesn't compete with Bitcoin. Well, yeah. I mean, it, it helps it. And, right. and even Ethereum, Absolutely. I think Ethereum is stronger because Bitcoin exists. For sure. I mean, Ethereum wouldn't exist without with, Bitcoin. And, right. and the fact that Bitcoin's around is good for Ethereum and vice versa. So I, I think the a lot of people have forgotten who the enemy is. The enemy is not crypto technology and different free market um, currencies and platforms and ideas and experiments. The enemy is the fiat banking system. Mm -hmm. And the war money created by the government, the Federal Reserve, and all the other central banks around the world who yeah. don't have an open blockchain, who don't have open source money, who you don't know what their inflation rate is. You know, you have no visibility inside this little black box that they put on their pearly gates, you know, and it's just, they are the enemy. And I really hope that everyone listening to this show Bitcoin maximalists or not, like let's let's like recenter our focus and let's just like 
take a couple breaths, calm down. Please understand that the other side has really valid points. And just like you, they want Bitcoin to succeed. And let's just like try to like circle our wagons around the success of like free market money and refocus ourselves on what the real fight is here, right? The real fight is to try to bring free market, voluntary, honest money into the community, into our economy, because that's what's going to like flourish and, and create a level of wealth and value that's going to bring everybody up. You know, we talk about wanting to help the third world or the underprivileged, but we're not doing that whenever we're fighting internally. Who's keeping all those people down is the government and their money and, and this warped, demented system, of the economic system of fractionalized, fractionalized money that is force-based. And we're not in that community. We are in, we are in a community together, but yet we keep fighting each other to the point that it's delaying and retarding our own growth. So I'll get off my soapbox here. Yeah, I, I, would, I would sum it up by saying, you know who's really thrilled about the block size debate? Oh, the government is. And Jamie Dimon. Oh, for sure. Right? Absolutely. I mean, who, who's laughing at the Bitcoiners more oh, yeah. than the banks? Absolutely. Um, so hopefully that hopefully that will end. I, you know, I'm more bullish than ever on, on crypto. It, it overcomes every challenge. It, it is inevitable. Um, honey badger. It's honey badger. Right? It is. Um, and, pe and the people in the community should, should remember that and they should start being friends again. And that sounds very kumbaya. I know, but it's like so true. But there's though. so many real fights coming. Yeah, like there's the so real, many. The real fights haven't started yet. Right. The real, the real fight against from crypto to fiat has not started. Mm. Crypto is still too small, too insignificant, right. not taken seriously. But if it keeps growing, it will be. And then the real fights will start happening. And if the community is not um, cohesive, is not allied, then it's going to be less likely that crypto wins. On that note, Eric Voorhees, I am so appreciative for you coming on to Liberty Entrepreneurs. You know, this is an amazing conversation, probably the longest interview that we've had on Liberty Entrepreneurs. We had a lot of stuff to talk about. Is there any words of encouragement or any advice that you would give um, young entrepreneurs who are just starting their journey on creating their own business and building their own freedom that can like speed them up a little bit? Um, the, wor the words of encouragement would be that until cryptocurrencies came around, all the innovation and hard work that you did existed in this little cage of what was permitted by, f by the fiat system. Um, and you don't have to be in that cage anymore. You don't have to be tied to government money. You don't have to be, you don't have to care what the federal reserve does anymore. You, you can build a business that is, um, un unconstrained or un untethered to the, to the fiat system, which, which for anyone who cares about freedom and especially any entrepreneur who wants to build things valuable, that is a great advancement. Uh, so whether you're like deep in the crypto industry or not, the fact that that technology exists and that you can now have sovereignty over wealth and money will help not only all entrepreneurs, but I think all people around the world. And so that's, uh, that's something we, that we can all look forward to. Ladies and gentlemen, the Eric Voorhees, the website is shapeshift.io. Eric, if anyone wants to uh, keep in touch with you, how should they do it? Uh, email is eric, E-R-I-K, at shapeshift.io or uh, on Twitter, Eric Voorhees, E-R-I-K-V-O-O-R-H-E-E-S. Eric Voorhees, you are definitely a Liberty Entrepreneur. Thank you so much for coming on the show. Thank you, Ash. Wow, what an interview, right? If you stayed around to the end, then kudos to you. Please remember to tune in again. Like I said, I'm not sure exactly how this podcast is going to work in the coming months, but I can assure you that the perspective of building freedom through the entrepreneurial process is something I'm very, very passionate about, and we will speak again very soon. Please share this interview with your friends, especially if they're Bitcoin friends, because we've got to move past this and keep pushing forward with the next evolution in money. This was Liberty Entrepreneurs, episode 69, Inside the Mind of a Serial Bitcoin Entrepreneur, with special guest Eric Voorhees. I'm your host, Ash Whitener, and until next time, you know what to do. Keep building freedom.